Alex here with a video on hearings. This is a replacement video, and it is going to replace the following five videos, uh, hearings, trial format, trial format revisited, court reporters, and calendar calls. The most important thing about hearings and not, you know, being an attorney is if you haven't done any research at all and you haven't seen any videos, a lot of times you're going to make the mistake of assuming it's like Judge Judy or People's Court because ordinary people watch that stuff sometimes. And it's typically you walk into court and you just say stuff. That's it. The reality couldn't be further from the truth when it comes to pretty much any case that is not a small claims case. And <laughs> that's what this video, or actually all five of these videos, tried to tackle. I'm going to just lump them all into one video now. Kind of organize all of my thoughts on those different topics. There are all sorts of different types of names for hearings like review hearing, status check, motion hearing, lawn motion hearing, arraignment calendar call, evidentiary hearing, trial, bench trial versus jury trial, stuff like that. But it is true that all of those various different types of hearings have a specific role when it comes to what the court is trying to accomplish. But Probably the easiest thing to do is to just separate it into two categories, an evidentiary hearing or any other type of hearing. And the reason that it's important to do that is because evidentiary hearings, which would include jury trials and bench trials, require you to present evidence to the court, which means bringing stuff as well as um, witnesses. If you do not understand this, you're going to drive yourself nuts. Um, not just yourself, but possibly witnesses. Because if you're telling people to come to court and the judge is like, I'm not going to hear from them, that's frustrating to them too, especially if they took time off of work. Um, if you're issuing subpoenas and stuff, it could even be a bigger headache because that stuff could get confronted by the other attorney or by the particular person you're trying to bring into court and you could end up being punished for it. So if you're, if you're having trouble figuring out what exactly the point of your hearing is, at the very least, you have to figure out whether or not you're expected to present evidence to the court at that particular hearing. When I was representing myself in um, family court, very few of the hearings involved, well, I don't want to say very few, it was less than half. Um, a lot of times it's some other type of hearing, like a review or a status check or a motion hearing, and the court is just trying to hear from you to figure out if they even need to set an evidentiary hearing. And that's especially true in certain counties in Nevada. For example, Clark County, tons and tons and tons of hearings. And very few, my understanding anyway, of them are evidentiary. Kwashaw County, they have way less hearings. A lot of the things they just resolve on the paperwork. They don't even set hearings. Um, and so, you know, when the hearing does get set, there's more of a likelihood that it's going to be evidentiary in nature. Um, so you have to figure out what it is that you're expected at that hearing to do. Well, you know, like for arraignment, a lot of people have heard of that, maybe more people than usual. That's something where you walk in and you enter a plea, guilty or not guilty. Typically, that's all that happens at that hearing. A calendar call. Are you ready for trial? Typically, that's all that's discussed. Maybe some technical calendar stuff, but that's it. Um, if you go into one of those hearings and try to argue your entire case, you're just going to drive everyone crazy, the judge and the lawyers, and you're just going to get ignored. And then a lot of times you end up feeling like you were not treated fairly just because you don't understand that there was a very specific point to that particular hearing that you went to. I have seen sometimes a judge go outside the boundaries of the hearing and then get overturned on appeal. There was a recent case where a family court judge modified custody at a case management conference and the Supreme Court said, nope, reversed it, sent it back. Um, so, I mean, I guess that could possibly happen. There's not a whole lot you can do to that, you know, do with regards to that. If your judge is making a mistake, you're going to have to file an appeal, which I'm sure is extraordinarily frustrating for people to hear and for some people prohibitively expensive unless you're representing yourself. But I have seen it happen, so I can't act like it's just impossible. Um, Stacked. Sometimes hearings are stacked. What that means is there could be 5, 10, 15, 20 different cases at the same exact time as yours. And the judge just goes through the cases in a particular order. And you're just going to have to sit around and wait. Sometimes you could end up waiting an hour or two for your hearing to get called. It just it, Some courts do this, some courts don't. When I was uh, representing myself in my child custody case, I had never before seen this. 
I never understood this concept until I started to see court cases in Las Vegas. And then I started to see it. And then I later found out that it seems like uh, a Washoe County does actually do this in some types of courts, maybe criminal court or something. I've seen it before, I think. Um, anyway, this is, you know, the point of this channel is at least telling you, you have to try and find these things out because they can be very different from not just state to state, but from county to county, as I just described. So, yes, find out what the type of hearing is that you're going to. I mentioned motion hearing, arraignment, calendar call, and I kind of glazed over case management conference. At that type of hearing, they typically discuss how they're going to, you know, set up discovery and all the deadlines and timelines. Um, and then they may have, like, some kind of discovery-related hearings that pop up. And some courts, they actually have a specific guy that handles those like a discovery commissioner um handles those in some districts not in others in others it's just the judge same judge as always um so finding out what you are expected to do at that hearing will save you so much of a headache and potentially your witnesses and you'll probably feel less frustrated if you realize that the particular hearing you're going to no evidence is being pre presented anyway this is going to be one of the things that is the most jarring for people going through child custody cases because some of those earlier hearings in the child custody case involve temporary orders being entered and tons and tons of messages that I get are from viewers who are like, hey, I went to this hearing and my ex said a bunch of stuff and the judge believed them and now they have temporary custody. Well, you might feel like the judge believed them, but no evidence was taken at the hearing. So the judge made a ruling based on an allegation. That is alarming to a lot of people, but the judge has to do something while trial is pending. If you're going to have your trial three, four, five, six months, a year later, they have to set some kind of temporary something in place right now that's going to take effect until that trial date where they actually do take evidence. There are multiple examples, not just one or two, multiple examples of people who have messaged me and said, hey, the judge believed my ex and they got temporary everything. And then they go to court and they go to their actual trial and then they win everything. And they're like, whoa, I thought I was going to lose because the judge was just believing my ex. You know, you just don't understand how they think and how the machine operates. In fact, watch the video of the machine because they have to make a quick decision then and there without looking at any evidence based on allegations. It's just what they have to do. And when you end up in trial and they're actually listening to all the witnesses and looking at your evidence to you, it's completely shocking that they can just say, yeah. You were right. Here you go. Um, but to them, it's just what they do. That's just their job. That's how the court system works. It's a perfectly ordinary thing for them. So um, frustrating, very frustrating for people. A lot of people try to fight temporary orders tooth and nail, even though the appellate courts do not want to hear it. Um, if you want to learn more about that, watch the video temporary orders. You can also watch the video writ petitions because that's like one of the only ways to challenge them. But um, typically, if you don't like your temporary order, get to your trial as quickly as you possibly can. That's typically what I think is the most effective way to deal with it. Sometimes people have high, pro uh, high profile lawyers who can file multiple different motions and, and do something in the middle of the case until the trial is there. Some people can pull that off. I was representing myself. My opinion is it's not gonna happen. If you wanna know more why about my opinion is that, watch my video on the topic, self-representation bias. It's just there. Um, so my, my opinion is if you're representing yourself, you may as well just sprint to trial because you're probably not going to get listened to. Uh, again, I explain why this happens in the video, self-representation bias. Uh, if you are going to a hearing that's evidentiary in nature, you have to kind of figure out how it's expected to work. I used to have a video on this called Trial Format. Now I recommend just watching the Art Nevada Judges videos because then you can see it in action, what the trial format looks like. Um, typically, it's broken down to uh, opening statements, um, the case in chief for one side and then the other, and then finally closing arguments before you get your ruling. And there are very specific things that you're expected to do in each of those very specific phases. With opening statements, you tell the court what the evidence is going to show. Whether it actually does or not, they'll decide later, but you're at least giving the court a clue as to what to look for. Case in chief, that's when you're actually calling witnesses to the stand to testify and getting evidence admitted into court. And then um, the other side does their case in chief, your opponent's side. And then finally, you um, go into your closing arguments where you talk about how the court should rule based on the law and based on the facts that you presented. So please, these are just words coming from a guy talking to you on screen. The best thing that you can actually do is go to our Nevada judges and watch the trial so you can see what it looks like instead of just hearing me describe it. 
Um, I've never heard of evidentiary hearings being stacked ever. I've never heard of an evidentiary hearing, a jury trial, or a bench trial being stacked. But maybe it's a maybe they do that in a different way that I don't understand. I've just never seen it where they have like all these different lawyers and parties in the room and then they go through them one by one. Maybe they handle it some other way that I'm not aware of. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is, I guess I could mention, there's a little bit of a rule of thumb to this. If the hearing is really short, and most likely is not evidentiary, if you're talking like 15, 30 minutes, even an hour, that might be a clue that that's not evidentiary. My understanding is that evidentiary hearings and trials are usually set for like a half day, a full day, or multiple days. I have seen that before, where they are 5, 10, 15 day trials. Usually it's like a murder case or something, but it does happen. Um, I don't think I have ever heard of an evidentiary hearing being less than two hours, and the ones that I have heard of being in uh, two hour hearings are really rare, and the court probably warns everyone about that. It's a, a very short amount of time to present evidence to the court because there's examination of witness, cross-examination, and redirect, and all. There's a lot that goes on. It could seem like it's going to be quick, and it's not. <laughs> uh, next thing I wanted to mention is the transcripts. If you're going to file an appeal, you better hope that you can get transcripts of those hearings. I don't know about your state, but in Nevada, if you do not have those transcripts, the Supreme Court just assumes that whatever would have been in those transcripts would have supported the court, the decision that the court made. It's like an automatic loss. I'm not sure if there's any way around it. Um, some courts have videos of the proceedings. I used to think that all of the courts did. Why? Because I was a non-attorney representing myself and my case had videos. So I just assumed that's what all the courts do. It's a common thing. If you're representing yourself and you're not an attorney, you're going to go through court a few times. And you're just going to assume that's how it is all the time, every time, everywhere. And it's not. Uh, I found this out later. Uh, they call them JABS videos in Nevada. I forgot what JABS stands for. J-A-B-S. It stands for something. It's some kind of automated recording system. And um, if you can get a JABS video, you can then take that video and convert it into a transcript at a later date. Some courts do not do JABS videos. And if you go to a court that doesn't do that, you should probably ask if there's going to be a court reporter there. You should probably ask that question. If there is a court reporter there, then they will take uh, notes on their special little machine. I think it's called a stenography machine. If I'm wrong, make fun of me. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I think it's called a stenography machine, or and I think the court... I don't know what they're called. Stenographer or something like that. Um, and they will have these uh, cryptic sort of codes as to what they can turn it into or sorry, what they can read to turn it into a transcript later if you want them to. I guess they just save these somewhere, and then if somebody asks for a transcript, then they go ahead and convert them from their special notation to actual English. Um, and if that's the case, then same sort of thing as the Jabs video. You can kind of decide later if you want to actually get a, 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 the a transcript. Um, sometimes they don't have one. There isn't a court reporter or, or anything like that, and you have to arrange... For the court reporter to show up, I had to I had to do that one time with a, um, a summary eviction hearing, and the judge noticed. It's the first thing he said. He didn't say hi, Mister This, Mister That. He didn't say uh, calling this. He said, "Who hired a court reporter?" That was the first five words out of his mouth. I was like, "Whoa, it must be a big deal that I did this." Probably nobody else does it. Um, anyway, uh, that case I did win, so it's a good thing that I got that uh, court reporter there because it obviously it affected the judge. Um, so yes, check. Is there going to be somebody taking the record um, or a Jabs video? And if so, then you'll be able to kind of be, you know, rest assured that if you need to appeal, you can get a hold of a transcript. If not, then you have to find out how do I arrange for this court reporter to show up. Sometimes they'll charge you too. Sometimes they'll charge you a fee. Oral arguments in the Supreme Court slash appellate courts, they're rare. I've won Four appeals, I never went to oral arguments. Um, I've lost a bunch of appeals. Those never went to oral arguments either. They are very rare. Do not expect them if you are filing appeals. Um, the four times that I won, they just sent me an order in the mail saying I won, which actually is way less stressful, and I like that. Um, I also don't think that, mm, I can't say for sure, about all states, but Nevada does not let non-lawyers show up to oral arguments. So my understanding is that when they are thinking of doing that, they'll just offer you a free attorney to argue for you. I guess this is going to come down to uh, 
pretty much everything that I want to talk about with regards to hearings. When it comes to hearings, the more you see, the better off you're going to be. Um, and then, of course, you have your own personal experience, which is not something that you're going to expect a lot of when you are not an attorney. In fact, I think I mentioned this in the other video. This is one of the areas that, for the most part, we're going to be weaker than an attorney. Um, we can kind of catch up to them in the writing a little bit. There's just more writing involved in these cases, and you can hit the backspace key. You can't hit the backspace key, uh, key when you're talking. If you say something you shouldn't have said or you waste time, you just waste the time and you can't take it back and you're stuck. Um, so, yeah, oral arguments, going to hearings, trials, those are the areas where typically non-attorneys are weaker. Um, I, When I did um, get attorneys to help me, it was for those types of situations. Two different times I had an attorney help me for free at um, a hearing because I was just afraid this is not an area that I'm going to be very good at. And then uh, one time I had to pay an attorney to, no, two times I had to pay an attorney to show up at, for well, one was an evidentiary hearing, um, and that's on my, my docket series. And then the other one, well, also on my, the, my docket series, but that was much shorter. It was a TPR on adoption. So, yeah, I have recognized that this is one of the areas where it, if you can't afford an attorney for your whole case, but you can't afford an attorney for part of your case, having them come in to speak for you at these types of hearings is probably the area that you're going to want to choose to have your attorney at um, if you have to pick and choose because you just can't afford it. I'm going to add one more thing, actually. I was about to end the video, but I'm going to go ahead and incorporate one more old video into this video, and that is notice to set. Um, some jurisdictions, and in fact, the only one that I can think of off the top of my head is Washoe County. Maybe some of the other smaller counties do it too, but... Um, for sure, Clark County doesn't do this. Anyway, Washoe County will have, it does have rules on setting hearings. And sometimes the judge will tell you that you need to set a hearing, file a notice to set, etc., etc. The process is a little counterintuitive for a non-attorney. Um, you basically, for, you have to check the local rules. That's what I had to do in, in, uh, in my uh, jurisdiction. Um, and and comply in the sense of what is supposed to be in the notice to set as well as the specific dates and times that you're allowed to schedule the setting. Um, if I remember correctly, it was only three out of the five days of the week that you could do it, and it was only within certain windows of time. You can do it whenever you felt like it. Uh, you would basically file the notice to set with the court. You would serve it on your opponent, and then they would show up at that date and time and set the actual date and time of the hearing so it's a date you set a date to set the date for the hearing hope that makes sense to you guys um <laughs> the other thing that i wanted to mention is usually attorneys don't physically show up for that they usually just call the uh, department and set it over the phone um, i don't see why anybody really needs to show up in person for something like that if you can get the phone number and just, I mean, it's very, very short. You pick up the phone, they they respond, they say, okay, let me call the other attorney, they call the attorney, then you're all on the phone together and they say, uh, you know, can you guys do it on this day, on that day, on this day, everybody checks their schedules and then you come up with the actual date of the actual hearing. Uh, so yeah, that's the process for notice to set. And like I mentioned, if it's defined anywhere, it's going to be defined in your local rules and with my personal experience. In fact, if you watch the My Docket series, you'll probably see me file notice to, notices to set, and then you can see kind of what they look like and stuff. Um, the Before I close this video, I do want to just sort of glaze over the importance of also checking the local rules for um, additional documentation that you may need to file prior to a hearing, for example, the jury demand, um, witness lists. Um, you may have to file reports like the early case management conference report. So if you're going to a hearing and you find out the purpose of the hearing, the name of the hearing, you may also want to check the local rules and find out, am I supposed to file any sort of paperwork prior to this thing? And um, uh, there are also, they're not really hearings, but I will discuss them, mediation and settlement. I did a separate video on it, watch the video. They work very differently because they're not an adversarial part of the process. You kind of cooperate to come up with a, you know, a settlement, a deal. Uh, again, watch the video, mediation and settlement. And then there's another uh, important relevant video called proposed orders. 
it's too convoluted to lump into this video. Watch the video for post orders. I'm going to keep it separate, but it's highly relevant to hearings because oftentimes at the very end of a hearing, the judge won't prepare the order. Instead, they will ask the winning side to prepare the order. Uh, some judges are, are a little quirky about this. If you don't have an attorney, they'll instead, so you may win your case, but you don't have an attorney, they'll instead ask the losing side to do it because they actually do have a lawyer. Sometimes the judge is like, I don't know about this guy. He's not a lawyer. He might not prepare the order right or something. In any event, you can watch that video for all the details. Um, yeah, same as all my other videos. If you guys have any questions, feel free to post those questions down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.